Well, thank you all for coming and sh sharing our ideas with us. Um, uh, when I was first asked to come and, and talk a little bit and to speak with Locke, uh, it was very exciting to me. I, as you can tell, a lot of my research does involve neuroscience, but a lot of it does involve various spiritual practices, meditation, prayer. We've done studies on people speaking in tongues. We've looked at people doing Sufi practices and really trying to run the full gamut of how all of us in a variety, an infinite variety of ways almost, can be spiritual and how that does affect us. And that's really why it's very exciting for me to be here because I know a lot of you have experienced different types of practices, maybe have had different types of religious and spiritual experiences yourself. So I hope that um, some of the things that we have to share up here, some of the things that I may be able to share with you about our work, uh, what Locke and I may be able to talk about, could really uh, hopefully open up your minds to some degree and, and see it a little bit from a different perspective. Uh, one of the things that I, one of my favorite comments to me at one point was that uh, somebody was very appreciative that we gave them kind of a new language to be able to think about their spiritual and, uh, and religious nature, to talk a little bit about what's going on within them, not just spiritually, but biologically. And that that can sometimes be very important for people to understand not just that spiritual side of ourselves, but really how it affects all different parts of ourselves. And uh, as a physician, one of the things that I've come to realize, and, and many of my colleagues have, and this is also a very exciting movement in medicine, I think, is that we realize that we can't just look at people as biological. That seems to be the prevailing perspective on uh, the medicine side. And more and more people are realizing that we are not just biological beings, but we are psychological and social and spiritual. And I think that being able to look and explore all of these different dimensions of who we are as individuals and as people is just absolutely critical for us to understand ourselves uh, from, the, from the medical perspective to try to find the best ways of healing each other and healing ourselves. So I, I really look for this as a, as a wonderful mm -hmm. opportunity to be able to share some of these ideas with you and uh, also hear back, back from you a little bit later on in the program. And, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing a lot of the, the practical applications that, that Locke will, um, will bring to, to the conversation as well. Um, I should say just a couple of things briefly about uh, this new area of research that we've done, what, what's in the new book, uh, How God Changes Your Brain. Uh, if you're familiar with some of my original work, we were looking at how specific practices like meditation and prayer affect your brain at the moment. So we would do brain scans on people, and was always kind of fun and entertaining and a little amusing to be able to bring in uh, a very practice, practiced uh, Buddhist, uh, a person who was going to speak in tongues, bring them into our laboratory in the middle of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, hook them up to a machine to be able to see what's going on in their brain and say, okay, go ahead and, and do your practice and let's see what happens. And of course, it was always very exciting and maybe a little later on I'll have an opportunity to talk to you more specifically about some of the things that we've actually seen and, and found in the brain. But what I realized was, was that that's just one part of the discussion because it's great to know what happens in the brain when we're doing something, but how does that change your brain over time if you keep doing it? And of course, that really is a big question because we see so many people around us like Locke and maybe perhaps a number of you who have done practices for many, many years. And the question is, if you're able to change your brain in the moment, are you also changing your brain over time? And that's really what a lot of our new research has been looking at because one of the things that we started out was, well, is the brain of somebody who is deeply spiritual, who has been doing these practices for a long time, different than somebody who is not spiritual or at least has not been doing some of these practices for a long time? And there's been some fascinating studies by both myself and a few other uh, investigators who have shown just that, <coughs> that the brains are actually different. But then it's kind of a chicken and the egg question, right? If, you're, if the brain of an experienced meditator is different than a non-meditator, is it different because they had been meditating for 30 years? Or were they always built that way? Could we have somehow gone back in time and, and checked their brain out when they were five years old and said, gee, this is the person who's really going to get it. This is going to be a person who ultimately, if they follow the right path, can be enlightened. So the question is, where is that chicken and the egg answer? And we realized that while we can't go backwards in time, what we can do is take people who have not really done practices like meditation or prayer and start them on some kind of program and see what happens to see whether or not their brain actually does change fundamentally between after they've done the practice for a long time, and by a long time, I mean maybe even just a few months to start out with, 
Obviously, it'd be ideal to bring people back many years later and see how things are going, but we'll, we'll probably have to get to that a little bit later on. But at least to see in, in, in a short term, but at least, at least two time points where we can find out whether or not we can actually affect changes in a person's brain by simply having them do a particular type of meditation practice. And what our data do show, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, is that that does, that does happen. So at least in the chicken and the egg question, part of the answer is we do know now that the brain does change over time as you do different practices. Now obviously we probably all have some predispositions as well and that's some, something else that we'll have to look at into the future. And finally, some of the other pieces of information that we talk about more recently have been trying to understand how human beings actually do experience their spiritual religious selves. When they, talk, when they say, I've had a spiritual experience, what does that mean? In fact, one of the things that we talk about is an online survey that we've been running where we've gotten thousands of people's responses as to what their spiritual experience was. And it's really remarkable because I thought that they would really kind of come together very intensively. But actually, as it turns out, it looks like there is just such an incredible plurality of what these different experiences are all about. And sometimes it's not just asking people to describe their experiences, but then to ask them specific questions. Because if you do probe, you find out that they do also have a number of similar kinds of elements to them, even though they may not be the ones that the people actually talk about if you just say, just describe this to me. So these are the kinds of questions that I think we have an opportunity to look at. This is an area, as you heard the term neurotheology, which to me is, uh, while it has its, its pluses and minuses as a term, I think it's extremely exciting to think about the idea of using research and using scientific research to delve into what happens to us when we are religious and spiritual. And that's really been the goal of my work, which is to try to understand that. And as I think Locke and I will talk about a little bit more, is to try to unlock the, the positive aspects of these experiences and practices, because that's also something that we've learned. Obviously, religiousness and spirituality can be extraordinarily positive, but also can be negative at times. And it's also trying to understand that negative side, which I think can help us to find better ways of optimizing what these practices and experiences are, and try to lead us into a more compassionate approach to our lives and to ourselves. And I'll, I'll before we go into our dialogue, the last little story that I'll tell, and, and many of you may have heard it, uh, this has become one of my favorite little stories, which is that, and there's probably different variations on this as, as, a, as a general story, but the one that I had heard was uh, an, an American Indian boy was, got very upset one day because one of his friends stole something of his and he really wanted to go and beat him up and, and fight him and, and he was kind of upset because he said, should I be a forgiving person? Should I go and, and, and exact my revenge on him? And he went to his grandfather who was a very learned man and he said, you know, grandfather, explain this to me. Why do I feel this, this conflict between the part of me that wants to beat him up and the part of me that wants to forgive him and be compassionate? And the grandfather went into this story about how within each of our minds, and at least from my perspective, within each of our brains, there are these two wolves, he said. That the two wolves, one of them is the compassionate and loving and forgiving side. And the other side, the other wolf, is the aggressor, the, the one that's hateful, spiteful, wants to seek revenge. And the boy thought about this for a few minutes and he said, well, he says, well, grandfather, so well, if they're fighting each other, which one will win? And the grandfather looked at the boy and he said, it's the one that you feed. So I think that that's a very true statement because ultimately what our spiritual and, and biological and psychological and social pursuits lead to is whether or not we can try to absorb and embrace that compassionate side of ourselves or whether we wind up embracing the negative, hateful side of ourselves. And obviously, again, my work is to, to try to find better ways of embracing that positive side. But I think we also not only have to understand the positive side, but also try to understand the negative side so that we can figure out our best ways of turning these kinds of experiences around into something that's a benefit both to each of us as individuals and ultimately all of us as a global society. So I will stop there and let Locke <laughs> say a few things. I was told to give a little introduction, so. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So sometimes when I tell people I'm a meditation teacher, they'll ask me, uh, what lineage are you from? And I've started to say now I'm from the human lineage. 